each one of us. We are three speakers in today's series. We are going to talk about our research and what possibilities we can think of in terms of interdisciplinary research and then just leave things open for the audience to jump in, talk, discuss ideas. So I know some of your faculty, some of your students, uh, it would be nice to get your feedback, what you think about these projects. Um, I've chosen a topic uh, which is close to my heart and that's the research I've been doing, uh, is mainly looking at poverty levels, income inequality, and how these questions are connected to the development in countries. Okay, I need to figure this out. All right. Uh, so I'll quickly give you a broad review of my research so that you have some substantial idea what I have been doing. I'll give you some examples of my res recent work. And the series title for today is Technology Development uh, Economics and Human Rights. So how does it fit into this broader title? And last, lastly, what are the different ways in which uh, we can see collaborations appearing in this part? All right, so a bit about the research. The broad umbrella, if you think of, is the reference period is the last 20 years, which I have been looking for. And that was the time sort of when I became an economics student and countries were undertaking the so-called globalization process. So I was a master's student in India and we had uh, economic liberalization adopted in that country. We had major structural changes coming into the country, uh, trade liberalization, financial deregulation and so on. And uh, like many countries, we had the same debate, how is it going to affect poverty levels, income inequality, is it a good change or a bad change and so on. So I started looking at this whole debate and as an economist started looking for answers in terms of data. What can I see from the data? Can I answer some of these questions looking at the data? So broadly my research has sort of followed the pattern of looking at globalization and its consequences on these two broad themes. One is poverty, deprivation, you can think of inequality. I have recently worked on multidimensional deprivation, not necessarily income poverty. And the other one is, of course, uh, the talk about income inequality. Um, we have Thomas Piketty's uh, book, which is making some uh, news recently, since which is talking about the top income shares in different countries and income inequality has in increased over the last uh, decade or so. So if you see income inequality is a tops down uh, pyramid, we have about 82% going to the top one-fifth of the population and less than three to four percent to the bottom tenth of the population throughout uh, the countries. Let me give you some research examples of the questions I have asked or tried to answer. One of them is looking at uh, the impact of growth and income distribution on income poverty. So if you think about it, there are two ways in which Happen. And all these changes happen usually simultaneously. You cannot have growth followed by inequality changes, followed by changes in poverty. So it's very hard for us to separate out these impacts of different factors. So one way to look at it is can we have a counterfactual scenario? Can we develop a counterfactual scenario? And that's what I did with this project is looking at the Indian income distribution. We would say that if the economy grew at say 8 percent, but if distribution had not changed, what would have been the poverty levels? Then turn the question around and say, if distribution changed but we did not have any growth at all, what would have been the change in poverty overall? And we got some interesting results in the study where the large uh, impact or the significant contribution to the decline in poverty was coming out of economic growth. So though there were concerns about inequality, the impact of inequality on reducing or increasing poverty was much smaller and maybe that was because of the time period the growth process usually starts to have an effect immediately than the inequality process. But that was the way in, this, in which this uh, question was addressed. There is another way I am sort of, uh, I trickle sometimes with the data uh, by doing some non-parametric econometrics, so that's another field in which I work. And here we looked at the nonlinear relations. So this is, uh, I'm looking at different examples to give you the scope of the data I have been using. 
So, this is looking at the cross country data from the World Bank and we look at uh, different countries, mainly developing countries and we see that can we have some kind of a functional relation between inequality and poverty. So, we are looking at what we economists call the elasticity of growth for poverty. If one percent increase in income, how much poverty does decline, right. But that depends on how your distributions are going to change. So, we see that the relation is definitely non-linear and then we suggest a different way of approaching or measuring this elasticity. Um, a third research example is where I look at global poverty. So, if you look across the theme, it is the common thread is mostly measurement. So, I look myself more as a measurement economist. I look uh, at different ways in which these indices are measured. And one of the questions is uh, why do global poverty estimates differ so much? This was brought into picture mainly when we had the millennium development goals and everyone was sort of racing towards trying to reach those 15 targets for developing countries. But when researchers were estimating that they had wide discrepancies in which they were measuring global poverty. Global poverty is typically defined as a dollar per day poverty or a dollar and 25 cents poverty line. And you can see that though the trend is almost the same, there were wide uh, discrepancies in which the bank measures uh, which independent researchers like Salai Martin would measure and there was a debate about these. If you dig deeper into that, we had a method, this was mostly a methodological paper looking at what are the different assumptions made when people talk about global poverty and not many people are aware of these uh, assumptions when you are thinking of a dollar per day poverty line, but you are looking at data sources, where is the data coming from? You are looking at is the data based on household surveys that is a data or is it coming from national account statistics where you get an estimate of what would be the consumption of households. So that is going to be a very different estimate than if you do the survey data. There are methods in which you can estimate these income distributions. There is the scope of analysis and all the different adjustments you need to make these uh, estimates comparable. So, we give sort of a range of poverty estimates which would be comparable and not going into the details, but you can just see the variations in which if you apply one assumption at a time, how the poverty measures change. So, a note of caution this world of world development and we got some readers writing back saying that they have sort of lost their faith in global poverty measures. Well, that was not the intention of the paper. The paper is sort of making readers aware that if you want to follow a measure, you need to know what all different assumptions are made and not uh, compare oranges to apples then because poverty levels will change depending on which uh, on all those different factors that you are looking at. Um, Currently, I am more uh, involved in this project which is looking at multidimensional deprivation rather than poverty or income poverty, where in the US we are sort of outdated in terms of how we look at poverty. One thing is uh, our poverty lines are defined by family size, all of you are aware of that and they are updated over the years because of inflationary pressures, but they do not differ across regions. So, a person with some standard of living, living in say Iowa is compared to a person with uh, a different standard of living in California and you are using the same metric, which is a big problem. And uh, of course, there have been many different alternatives, but the official statistics has not changed mainly again because uh, I, I did wonder why the official statistics uh, did not change. And I was visiting this National Poverty Research Center at uh, Wisconsin. and. Uh, the faculty or the researchers there, they were senior faculty, they were like, oh, it is impossible for US official poverty measures to get changed at any time, just because they are entrenched in so many welfare programs that it is politically not uh, going to be feasible for anyone to touch the poverty thresholds anymore. So, what has been happening is we have experimental poverty measures, we have something called the supplemental poverty measure, which changes and give different estimates but they are not used for the program or the welfare program purposes. So, what this multidimensional approach is looking is um, it is considering all different uh, well-being indicators. So, you do not want to just rely on income, but you are looking at more 
of the philosophical approach by Amartya Sen, which is looking at capabilities of an individual. And can you capture the capabilities? The philosophical foundation is much stronger. It's very hard to bring into practice when you're looking at data. And you just look at different dimensions. You look at health dimension, education, standard of living, and so on, and try to see if there is some data available on one individual across these different dimensions. So this approach is much more data intensive. You want to have data on each individual on different uh, indicators, and then you define sort of the poverty or the deprivation level. Uh, giving you quick result on that, the for 2011, we did the calculation of the population because we are looking at adult uh, indicators. We found one in five individuals in the US were multidimensionally deprived, whereas the official estimate was about 12 to 13 percent. So definitely, deprivation is much more entrenched than what you see in terms of incomes. And that is what the paper is bringing the value on. My last slide, and that's the messy slide, which I is tried working on in the morning, and I then sort of cleared it out, because I was drawing these diagrams and these arrows connecting one thing to the other, and it became like a web or a spider. And in a way, it was a good sign, because I could see these connections. But then I said, OK, let me just put out all the arrows and just keep some of the bubbles, which I was thinking is, where is the overlap coming in? And I could think of all these different um, roles, and I have seen people at ISU work on some of these topics. So these are the type of uh, key words which I can think of when I'm thinking of, say, deprivation. I'm thinking of human rights in some way. I'm thinking of inequality. It's not always income. It's access, access to technology. Or we have a growing literature on energy inequality, energy poverty in developing countries. We are looking at globalization and its impact. Uh, we are looking at conflict and poverty, how are they related? We have people working in the health area, and this is a closely related topic to, again, deprivation in multiple dimensions. So I sort of just laid this as a mosaic, and maybe we'll come back once we have the sessions open. So I'll stop over here. Thanks for your audience. And I think we are just going to continue with the speakers and then maybe take up questions. Thank you. Uh, hello, and thank you very much for coming. Today was a weather shock, so which may have affected attendance. Carol said 35 people registered. But, um, so uh, my research is broadly on armed conflict and uh, economic development. And um, just to give you an introduction about one third of all developing countries experienced conflict as recently as 2002 to 2008. And the aggregate of impacts of conflict have been studied, and primarily they've been studied in developed countries. Like over a couple of countries with very good data, Japan and Germany, Vietnam, and we find that countries will go back on track pretty soon, 10, 15 years, and you are sort of back on the growth trajectory or the population growth trajectory. But with respect to uh, individuals who were exposed to this uh, life-changing events, even if you look at this uh, great recession that we experience here. I mean, sort of like we are back on track, stock market is booming, right, like, like hitting the highs. Um, I just heard the report on the jobs, and uh, they appear to be good and optimistic. But there is a generation, actually, that lived uh, and grew up during the Great Recession, and it may have affected them in a profound way. So uh, thankfully, since it develop, it's a developed country, it's not affected uh, them in a way that uh, will impact them, let's say, in terms of like, negatively with respect to their health. It may change their world views, most likely, and like, jobs that they go for. But in developing countries, many of those shocks, they have profound impact, basically, in, during the conflict. Um, I mean, the food supply is low. Um, there are, migration, diseases uh, that affect individuals and households. Countries can't catch up because their infrastructure is being destroyed. And uh, those you know, like early age impacts are very hard to reverse. Uh, let's say you grow, instead of growing up like that, you're growing into a different trajectory, you are shorter, 
Maybe you have less education because you have to keep your siblings in school. Um, and you have like lower uh, lifetime income. So, and I thought of it, and I thought of it, how does it tie with respect to human rights? And uh, with respect to human rights and uh, human capabilities. Um, because why would you think like conflict, it should be somewhere in security studies, right? Like, uh, but it fits together uh, very well with, because it impacts um, many aspects of human building, well-being uh, at different levels. For example, Millennium De um, Development Goals, uh, we were trying to achieve it by 2015. I guess it's not going to happen in many countries. And um, all of them, right? If you look one, two, three, uh, reduce child mortality, four, improve maternal health combats AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, those are actually would be impeded by the conflict of fragile environment ongoing. Uh, refugee camps uh, serve as a great breeding ground for all kinds of infectious diseases, and it impacts neighboring population that may be actually just hosting the refugees. So all of those are related to conflict and could be improved. And the last two goals are sort of maybe higher level goals. Once you achieve, uh, you know, good health, um, you are not likely to die tomorrow. Like when you focus on some other aspects which are I mean, sort of a little, little like higher on the hierarchy, on, like lower on the hierarchy of needs. So I also looked at core capabilities um, that should be supported by democracies. And some of them we take also for granted um, living in a democracy in a developing country, but some of us wouldn't be taken for granted in conflict-affected countries. For example, life, ability to live a productive, healthy life until um, normal length, you're not dying uh, prematurely. Uh, bodily health, good health integrity, um, you are move freely from one place to another without being assaulted. Right? And that affects individuals uh, in conflict-affected environments. Another thing that is important, actually, and I thought of it, uh, ability to being able to have attachments, right? Uh, attachments to people that um, you like and people who are outside yourself that you find important and without being persecuted for those attachments. And that happens in countries affected by political repression, such as Zimbabwe, North Korea, under Stalin, right? Like, I mean, officially, if you are son of someone who has been repressed, you are not and um, shouldn't be under attack, but it's remembered, it's long remembered. Um, so applies also to other things, like practical reason includes uh, freedom of religion, and we go to freedom of affiliation, right? Freedom of affiliation, non-discrimination, um, protecting institutions that encourage forms of social interactions, and co control over one's environment is also being impeded under the conflict because there are different groups, and you are basically in constant danger. And, um, um, potential loss of life, right? So uh, if you are going to OECD definition, well-being has several dimensions, and income is actually one of the dimensions, Shad actually mentioned that, but it's one of the important ones because once you have like a high level of income, you are able sort of to buy many other aspects of your well-being, right? You are able to care for, get an education, have a cleaner environment, <laughs> have a relatively long and healthy life. For example, we had a talk by Ken Arrow last year, and he said one of the global achievements over the years, one of the global development achievements is like life expectancy, that it has increased in many countries, and it has increased um, at a steady rate, and people living longer, right? Um, so people are not expected to live like to 50 years like on an average, which is actually true for conflict-affected countries, for some of them life uh, average lifespan is 46 years, so which is pretty long. So my research focuses on impact of armed conflict on households and individuals. So those individuals living in extreme um, environments, 
Like, so we're affected by different kinds of shocks. It could be income shock. It could be um, shock of security, right? You can lose your assets. You can lose your life. You can lose your loved ones. You may not be able to travel to sell your crops. So my studies address the number of questions. Um, I have a, a focus on also on human capital development, such as education and health. Uh, and I looked at that in India, Tajikistan, Zimbabwe, and Cote d'Ivoire. And I looked at migration and remittances because households, I mean, they live under those uh, risk conditions and like, um, insecure environments, but they adjust, right? Let's say, we have heavy traffic in Atlanta, people adjust, we change their behavior. Same happens here, people adjust, and, but how do we use the adjustments, right? For example, uh, recently there was a number of reports looking at uh, brides, young brides of Syrian refugees, right? If you see anyone caught a story. Uh, what happens where women, like very young, I don't know, women, like you can't call them women, they're teenagers, they travel with, um, their families, their refugees, and uh, family says, like, okay, you can't stay with, I mean, we don't feel that it's going to be safe for you to be unmarried, right? There are many young males around. Um, why don't you get married to someone else, someone of? And like, we don't have enough income, so you go to husband's family where they take care of you. Sounds good, right? But is it a good strategy? I mean, it f feels good sometimes, like, right? Like, but Many of those girls, they end up uh, with children born at like 16, 15 years of age, right? It's lifetime changing impacts, and many of them were still children. Like, so the education has been interrupted, and some of them actually go back to live with their families because, um, I mean, my husband doesn't, don't want them anymore. Like, so. um, and that's one of the coping strategies that could be used, right? Um, by households. So uh, with displacement, you have a, a large displacement of population and movement. You have different uh, deprivations in terms of your income. You have no access to infrastructure, which is often destroyed, or it would be unsafe for you to travel. And society is less trusting in the, um, as a result of war. For example, we looked at a study with my students and people said uh, an interesting thing. Um, they looked at the community in Sierra Leone that experienced war, and they said, uh, people said, we actually we trust people, but not from our village. We pe trust people outside, but not from our own village, because probably we have a good reason not to. Um, so, and, uh, so the research line addresses a lot of uh, important questions, and it's generalizable because the methods could be applied to situations such as impacts of terrorism, natural disasters, uh, random acts of terror or crime. Um, because uh, basically what we are look at how people change their behavior when the shock, they experience some kind of shock. So a civil conflict is an extended period of shock experienced over time. Let's say with terrorism events, um, Probably everybody remembers Boston bombing, right? Uh, Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, we have a family who lives in Boston, and that summer, we, after the bombing, we visited them and said, like, why don't we go and watch the fireworks for 4th of July? And they said, like, um, we don't go to public events with children anymore. Because, uh, and then I read an article that looks at the technological aspect of it and says, they are, um, now, like, actually doing a lot of imaging and screening people who attend different kinds of events, right? Sort of, like, if you go to a concert, um, there is a lot of cameras around, and we know who face recognition technology. So it affects society in different ways, right? Like, at the technological as well as individual level. So I use um, rigorous uh, um, analysis. I can use data from households and individuals that are collected by reputable organizations, and those data are becoming more and widely available. So those are the, uh, some of the websites that host the data sets that range from, you know, 2,000 households, which would, could mean about 16,000 individuals in one. 
And uh, with respect to conflict, um, initially I started by collecting data myself from various sources, like, like reading news reports, reading books. And here like, uh, you have a lot of investment because you have to understand um, what's going on, right? You have to understand who is involved in the conflict. Like, and then you have to map those locations because they do change names over time. And now there are data sets collected by third parties, like by um, where is the PC Research Institute in Oslo, um, very well known in this field, like that collects, like, I mean, that uh, was one of the initiators of collecting armed conflict locations and event data set. So we do, um, I mean, almost now real time tracking from news reports uh, and focus on Africa and a little going further to India and Afghanistan. Like this is like some of the data sources I use, like people use a variety of them. So I look at them, uh, two recent representative projects. One recently has been published in the top field journal of development economics with my colleague uh, who actually traveled to Cote d'Ivoire. She was a country economist for, the con for Cote d'Ivoire uh, quite a few years back. And, um, uh, another is uh, with Prakash Singh, who is uh, at um, Amherst College. So the first project, we, basically we want to see how conflict in Cote d'Ivoire affected children who were very young, between age of zero and 60 months, which means they're under five years old during that time. And uh, what we particularly were really excited about that paper is all about that project that the government decided to collect the data on household experiences during the conflict. Typically, governments they may not be wanting to do that. Let's say in many countries that experienced conflict, they don't collect ethnicity data anymore because it could be dangerous. Or like they don't want people to be potentially identified later on. Let's say Tutsi versus Hutu in Rwanda. So uh, that's Cote d'Ivoire, former economic powerhouse of West Africa, um, actually quite wealthy country for the region. And when it was hit by the conflict, when the conflict just started, and actually I spoke to two students, I mean now actually we are professors at different places, who were students from neighboring African countries studying in Abidjan at the time. And they all like, report that, you know, like we were worried once, like I was under the hiding under my bed for a number of days, like I couldn't go to school. And I was said like, that we had high security around the president's palace, but the problem was that it also was a target, potential target, due by the military. So uh, that's the northern region of Koroga that was affected by a lot. Um, uh, the rebels came from this region. So the conflict was, uh, I mean, it's followed sort of similar path as many. It was about five years long. Um, but with respect to the war, like not so many people died directly during the conflict because there was an initial wave of violence and people like split between two sides of the region. But displacement of population was substantial for a country which is about uh, 14 million large. Uh, these sizes. Uh, pretty high, right? So 25% to 12%. Um, so, and since the conflict started, like a little bit with respect to voting uh, rights and like uh, benefits of being the, sort of being from Cote d'Ivoire, your parents being both there. So there was widespread harassment of foreigners and migrant focus. There was also a lot of anti-French sentiment because French participated like, by providing forces. So we use data on violence from armed conflict event locations uh, data set. And basically we match it to different provinces in Cote d'Ivoire. So and the darker shade of province represents uh, more events reported in that particular data set. So, and if you notice here, like the many events reported in the Western region, although um, originally people said, I mean, people said, 
And we read multiple reports trying to identify which region was more affected. I mean, from qualitative data, like the quantitative data says that. But what we, uh, our report said like that the most of the conflict happened here, sorry, uh, rebels were here, and the government controlled territory were here. And here there was a lot of degradation of uh, public health services, public education services. So that Western region is, um, interestingly, it's bordering Liberia with a lot of violence. And Liberia at that time experienced uh, war itself. There were refugees camps across the border. And um, according to reports, like Liberian militias also crossed the border to Cote d'Ivoire. And they were particularly violent, as reported. So I use, uh, um, statistical regression model. So like, um, the thing that we I want you to think about is uh, my dependent variable. What I want to see uh, the impact on is height for age zisco. It's a long-term measure of child health. Basically, it shows how child is developing. So the, because height, you can't sort of catch up on height very fast. If you lost height, you can catch up on weight. Uh, but not on height. Um, and uh, I want to estimate if being from that conflict region, from the darker shade region, had an impact for being a very young child during the war. So and if you're looking at this bot table on top, you find um, actually sizable impact at point, um, three point four standard deviations, depending on the regression model. Um, which is comparable to our studies on this topic. So like, um, so like the negative, it means that it's negative impact. And um, it's highly statistically significant, so it means that it's robust. Um, that we would find this impact if we try to do a study again and again for a different set of children. So uh, another exciting thing, as I mentioned, was here like when we had like victimization categories. And if you notice here, we have conflict region, non-conflict region, and People from both regions respond that we lost assets. Um, we lost some kind of livestock. But there is more reports in conflict region. More people also were displaced. If they had more violence reported in that region, and more places were victims of violence, more people. Okay. So um, that's a nice map. And also, like when we map it by victimization level, it shows that. Again, actually, a border in Liberia, although we did estimate robustness to it, um, was an important for having all those shocks. Um, yeah. So um, basically, we find very similar impacts with respect to child health as from our studies and economic losses. That's like one of the major contributions. We find that economic losses are part of other types, in addition to other types of impairment during a conflict are very important and profound impact on child health. So, and this is another study. Uh, I'll just go very briefly uh, through it. It's with, um, uh, we look here at the impact of a Punjab insurgency. And Punjab is a state in India, and it's twice the size of Cote d'Ivoire with respect of population. It's 27 uh, million individuals live there. So the roots of insurgency were complex. It was about, uh, like started with uh, language not re being recognized in schools, like there was a separatist movement. Uh, the Indian government tried to tackle the insurgency by attacking the insurgents who were hiding in one of the biggest Sikh temples, uh, which actually led later to a backlash and assassination of Indira Gandhi by her two Sikh bodyguards. So there were anti-Sikh riots, and um, Punjab was characterized as a case of civil war. So what is interesting here, because it's a like regional insurgency within a country which hasn't been studied as much, because like, a lot of research has been on, empirical research has been uh, on sort of whole country conflict. So, uh, and we find that. Um, Children, particularly girls, were lost uh, in terms of education. They were underachievers in terms of education as compared to boys from this region. And we related to 
potential gender discrimination um, uh, by families uh, in this region. So, and if you look here, like you'll see some common themes, like, so like we, we like maps, because we want to do a lot of historical analysis to understand where we can, I mean, well, place located, what does it border with, how did the conflict spread between different regions. And you could see that, like, sort of it starts uh, somewhat slow, and when it spreads all over, with greater uh, impact in different locations. These are some of the pictures of the impact associated with uh, terrorists operating in the state of Punjab. And there are definitely controversies. Some people would call these people terrorists. Some people call uh, that it was not like a terrorism. It was a liberation movement, right? So there's a, um, the timeline of killings and the talk, um, by of civilians and terrorists and of security forces. So it didn't come out um, very tight, but it, you could see that there is more of civilians and terrorists and like there is a very similar pattern across all types of deaths, like with respect to time. So if you look at common themes between most of my projects, it's uh, uh, with I do, like, uh, like my co-authors do a lot of historical and institutional analysis of a country case because we want to understand actually what happened, uh, how it happened, like uh, what were the sides there, what were the economic situation, what factors affected population. Uh, we collect the data or like we use second party sources on data and we try to map it and try to understand because I mean I like visual representation and uh, it's moving towards that. And we do rigorous statistical analysis, trying to, what we are trying to do, we are, we are trying to pin down that the conflict impacted the individuals. It's not something else. It's not that we were poor beforehand, and that's why we find this impact. We want to um, conditional poverty. Was it impact of conflict that we observed? And we are trying to go like, through a lot of hoops there. Um, to see what happened. So I have uh, several new projects and ideas, like some of them drawn uh, my research with respect to conflict, looking at the um, dam construction in Cambodia and the um, land conflict it created because it displaced people and also potentially health impacts there, uh, firms and conflict in India. We have a panel data set coming from Colombia and data coming from various sources, from households as well as government, gov the government. And we are lucky to know people who collected those data. So, um, and uh, some of um, kind of our projects that look at uh, trying to look at Iran-Iran conflict and nighttime lights, looking at them. So there is a now interesting area taken off in economics, looking at sort of a spatial variation. How do we measure spatial growth with respect to nightlife? Um, perspective, using a lot of satellite data that people have been collecting over years. And now it's finally becoming available. Now you have computing for capacity to analyze it. And I have a kind of a project that I'm actually cu very curious about, looking at the impacts in city regulations of aggressive panhandling that happened all across America during the recession time, and looking at the impact of crime. So is there some kind of transference mechanism there? So, and I have a project with um, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, where we use like, land cover and land use in Central Asia, also satellite mapping with respect to finding what changed. And here are some potential collaboration opportunities. Like, um, my research addresses gender and education and health. Um, I think I see it going towards a lot of use of a lot of satellite data um, over time, making use of uh, information there. And big data methods, for example, I've been approaching people have, uh, let's say, cell phone records for all people in Cote d'Ivoire that moved around. But, um, and I'm really hopeful that we can use some of the computer scientists here like, to be able to analyze this data and to map it. Thank you.
Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming out on this uh, rainy day. Um, really appreciate it, Friday afternoon. Um, I want to thank Carol for being the force behind this uh, series. Um, anything that brings together the faculty across, whether it be the institute or, in, or the college, I think is really valuable. Um, I want to thank Olga and Shatakshi for inviting me to be the fill-in speaker. Um, originally, I was not um, scheduled to be on the uh, part of the series, and I'm quite honored to, to be uh, speaking. And originally, when um, Olga asked me, uh, you know, I sort of made this observation that, well, yes, a lot of my work deals with technology. There are aspects that deal with development, but I don't really do human rights. Um, and I made this comment to a friend of mine who's a uh, reporter at the Pittsburgh Tribune, and he very quickly you know, said, hey, you probably should revise that in the event that you appear before the International Criminal Court someday. My area of expert scholarly expertise is not human rights. Although ironically, and I'm going to be talking about a couple different disease outbreaks, including the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and ironically, you know, this public health military nexus when President Obama was here in Atlanta at the CDC making the, the initial announcement with respect to the sending of 300 troops to West Africa, the impetus that he invoked largely was, had an underlying human rights. It was responsibility to protect that the United States has a responsibility to take our capabilities, our capacities, to address this, global, this potentially, potential global scourge. So very much couching it in human rights language. Um, of course, what he could not say was, we're going there because we don't want it to come here. Um, that is, you know, that's, as the uh, academic, I can say that. Um, so again, I'm going to be looking at some of these issues Global health security um, comes from a project that I started about four years ago, where I was really interested in deterring bioterrorism. And then going to sort of track this forward. Um, and as I was listening to Shataxi and Olga, I'm sort of seeing places that I didn't even realize where our work has potential to intersect, because some of the causal variables of why these outbreaks are occurring our civil wars, our poverty, our efforts to deal with those. OK, so the original motivations for me pursuing this work, um, I do largely international and domestic security, national security. That's the realm in which my scholarship, my work is um, situated. Uh, so specifically, I was interested in looking in new ways to deter bioterrorism. So deterrence, of course, is a concept, comes originally out of uh, criminal justice, but has a long history and a wonderfully developed theoretical foundation in terms of nuclear deterrence. States, state behavior. So I'm interested in how do we think about deterrence from nuclear to bio, and then also the difference from states to non-state actors. And it should be acknowledged that there are many terrorism experts, including Martha Crenshaw, one of the leading te uh, terrorism experts at Stanford University, who challenge the idea that terrorists can be deterred. Now, I'm in the camp that says, yes, there are mechanisms. It's just much more difficult to deter terrorists. This goes you know, to these broader issues of international domestic security and issues of reducing the threat of weapons of mass destruction the United States to our allies and to the global community in large. Um, and one of the pieces that we, we can look to is, in particular in the uh, case of Al-Qaeda, is that one can find evidence, clear evidence, of interest in acquiring biological agents. And this is sort of the first thing you have to do, is rather than just toss out there that, well, yes, non-state actors want to acquire these, it's how do we determine that they want to, and show that they're actually interested in using them and for what means. And I have a whole nother brief where I go through this, so just in some encapsulation, focus on a couple different things. One, the rhetoric, what do they say, what do they print, what do they promulgate, 
And then just as important from my perspective is what are they doing? So you start looking at the material aspects. What are the facilities? What are they doing in terms of actual attempts to, to acquire? As opposed to just talking about this, is there evidence of actually pursuing that? And in the case of Al-Qaeda, particularly Al-Qaeda in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, there was clear evidence both in terms of the rhetoric as well as activities looking to acquire biological agents. And then finally, I'm, most, all of my work is motivated by this sort of intersection of bridging the liberal arts and social sciences, this terrorism studies, deterrence, securitization, and the life sciences, um, and epidemiology. You know, so our bridging across the different sides of the institute and over to places like CDC, um, with coming up with ideas for implementable and executable policy. You know, how can what we our robust scholarly work have implications in the national and the policy realm? And just a couple examples of that. CTR um, being from the Nun School Cooperative Threat Reduction is part of our you know fabric, um, our weft and waft. You know, it was one example, thinking about 21st century cooperative threat reduction, and then science diplomacy. How can scientists be engaged as individuals to do what's called track two diplomacy? So these were some of the original motivations as I started this project. Um, and this project came out of um, observations, as many times projects do, in which there was a reemergence of polio Initially, in the northern three states of uh, Nigeria, specifically it came out of the northern state Kano, that in the course of two years, reinfected 16 states went from less than 1,000 cases of polio in 2003 to more than 61,000 in 2005 including reinfecting countries like Indonesia that had been polio-free for more than 10 years. So in October of 2003, Muslim clerics in, the northern, in this northern state of uh, Nigeria declared that all polio vaccination would stop. And there were a variety of different reasons given. They were things that one encounters like there was concern that this was going to cause sterilization in infants, or there were rumors that this was then going to cause male, um, it was going to it was sterilize male uh, babies or uh, cause AIDS in infants. So these northern Nigerian states, which are Muslim, they basically stopped immunization in two, October of 2003. Immunizations did not begin again until August of 2004. You saw this reemergence of polio again to 20, it spread to 21 nations within two years. Um, it's also it's notable where it did not spread to. You do not see it spreading to Saudi Arabia, although this is following. It followed basically the route of the Hajj. Saudi Arabia put in place strict entrance uh, rules in terms of you had to demonstrate you had been vaccinated from polio to get into the country. It also did not spread to northern Europe, places in which there are large Muslim populations but have much more robust public health uh, infrastructure. So as I went through this, and I began what I call rethinking bioterrorism deterrence, polio emerges as a case study in which one can think about the role of the public health infrastructure, which has been previously acknowledged as having a role with respect to responding to bioterrorism. Now, this is our, cap our national capability and our capacity to respond to bioterrorism. Now, thinking about it more broadly in terms of its role in deterrence, that is, as one communicates, and particularly communicates credibly, the ability of a nation, for example, the United States, to respond 
to infectious disease, largely through our public health uh, infrastructure as well as other mechanisms, we are communicating that even if you use an infectious disease, it is not likely to impact us. Rather, it disparately impacts one's own community in these states in which you have low public health infrastructure. Um, strategic communications becomes much more important in these cases, and that is the ability to communicate this in a way that is commensurate with our broader strategic position and also commensurate with the goals of public health. Which you're never going to come out and say, oh, we're, we're not going to fund robust public health in terms of, in order to increase our deterrence, particularly in other states. So there are broader conditions. So one has to look at this as a much more complicated situation. Polio is, was initially um, looked at as an interesting model because it is this contagious infectious disease, it's transmissible human to human, but it's not perceived as a bioterrorism threat. And when one is talking about, particularly in the policy world, sometimes it's useful to talk about things that are not the agents themselves. And I'd previously looked at this in the context of work I'd done with regard to contaminating the food supply. Um, looked at a case in which alpacas were killed. Anybody, know, anybody have seen an alpaca? They're like, they're little llamas. Um, there was an outbreak in which food, the feed for alpacas was contaminated, and almost 10% of the U.S. Al alpaca population was killed. Now, very few people ever heard about that because alpaca does not play a big role in our economy. Now, on the other hand, if 10% of the cattle, 10% of the pigs, or 10% of the poultry were killed, that would have significant economic have significant security. So it's talking about, one can sometimes talk about and look at issues related to terrorism by specifically looking at a case that has all of or very similar characteristics, yet it is not an agent. So that was why polio was, was, in, was one more reason why it was really interesting to uh, do this. Um, in doing this work, you also did some very, very simplistic analysis looking at um, the comparison of investment in public health infrastructure. And I'm acknowledging that is very simplistic because I, you know, I'm speaking with two colleagues who do hardcore quantitative work. Um, so we were just looking at um, what's the, the, the investment per capita, and one finds, not at all surprisingly, that the states in which you have higher investment per capita you get less likelihood. So there's a lot of places where this could be done much, much more robustly. And I think you could, you could um, pull further on the uh, initial results. So I want to shift now um, with that brief sort of uh, look into one project to thinking about some of these uh, questions in the context of Ebola. And I'm, I'm in the process right now of thinking about how this is going to be influencing um, future work of mine. Um, notably, the first piece I want to talk about is how it connects back up to polio. Since 2005, there has been a reinvestment in the attempt to eradicate polio. The goal is to eradicate polio by 2019, uh, make it the second infectious disease ever eradicated from the planet following smallpox. Significant effort has been made by the WHO and the CDC to do work in Nigeria, because Nigeria is one of the three remaining states where polio is still endemic. Afghanistan and Pakistan are the remaining two. India was just declared polio free about six months ago. Um, so there are polio vaccination teams in Nigeria. There's a strong, robust organizational capacity in Nigeria. There are logistics change, 
and they have established relationships with people throughout the different levels of the government in Nigeria, including individuals who are from Nigeria, from those states affected, who are the ones who go out and are the actual face of the vaccination teams. So when we had the 19 cases of Ebola that popped up in Nigeria, what the WHO and the CDC basically did, this is a, you know, a bit of simplistic, but they said, okay, you guys who are polio, you're now Ebola. And most importantly, they were already there. They had been doing this for five years. The infrastructure, the organization, all those different pieces were already in place. And you're not vaccinating against Ebola. You're quarantining and you're isolating. And it's credited that having this infrastructure there, organizational capacity, enabled them to stop the spread of Ebola in Nigeria. So you have that fast organizational response with strong local connections. So one of the fundamental questions that a lot of people are asking right now is, why is this outbreak different? More people have died in this outbreak than have died since Ebola was discovered in 1976. There were over 6,000 people infected. Um, previously, it had been about 5,000. So there are a number of different potential explanations. I mean, the first one is very much going back to the biology. Ebola is a virus that is considered to be a fast evolver. It uses something called horizontal gene transfer. Um, it's estimated that, and there just was uh, data that came out in Nature um, about three months ago, where they looked at it, and this, the initial outbreak from, that started this time in Sierra Leone that was then taken to, to Guinea, it's had about 395 mutations since the Ebola that it developed from 10 years ago. So that was what started it in Guinea. There have been 50 mutations in the Ebola in the last month. And that would be from, this was, it was published in July, June to July. So this is a very fast mutating virus. Some viruses are very stable. Smallpox actually is an incredibly stable virus. Ebola, on the other hand, just by the nature of it, is a very fast um, evolving virus. So that's one explanation. Of course, that's also the explanation or the, the, the um, characteristic that prompts concern about Ebola becoming air transmissible. Currently, it is not air transmissible. You actually have to come in contact with fluids. Um, so there are the other questions, which I think in many ways are the much more interesting ones, particularly interesting from a social science perspective, is what is the relationship potentially causal with respect to differential development and investment? Now, it's well known that roads and global tools, well, roads in particular, helped the spread of AIDS in the 1980s and the 1990s. That is, Largely, it's as there have been investments in building roads, you no longer have isolated communities. In the past, Ebola has largely occurred in small, isolated communities. So it essentially, and sometimes it's, it's said, it burnt itself out. Well, now you have people who are traveling, so your people are not becoming symptomatic can take up to 21 days to become symptomatic from Ebola. Most of the time, it's shorter than that. But you can travel because you have the means and the infrastructure is there. So while we've invested in development for things like roads, there has not been commensurate development investment in increasing these public health infrastructures in these nations. There's a whole lot of reasons for that, and there's not been commensurate emphasis on education. A number of these places, the idea of germ theory, which is basic to us, um, situations where you have people who do not understand germ theory. That is that germs cause diseases. This is why we wash our hands before you have somebody go into surgery. Um, so you see concerns with regard to attribution. Now, one has to be careful in terms of the education placing too much emphasis 
because it came, it was revealed about uh, two, three weeks ago that there actually are lower vaccination rates in some of the richest parts of Los Angeles County for MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, than there are in South Sudan. So one has to look at and sort of pull apart not only the education, but also some of the ideological, the cultural, and the historical issues. And again, it goes back to those local connections. Um, but I particularly want to highlight, again, I'm leveraging the work that's been done with respect to AIDS and the transmission of AIDS. This is a paper, this is a graphic from a paper that appeared in Science, literally the most recent issue of Science, in which they did genetic fingerprinting and traced the evolution of the AIDS virus back to the 1920s and saw how it moved along the rails, you know, the railways in the DRC from the 1920s up through the 1960s. So not an unprecedented explanation, but in terms of thinking about this in the context of the current Ebola, it isn't just thinking about the roads and the infrastructure, it's how have we invested differentially. You know, we invest in roads and these other pieces that are seen as part of economic development frequently without investing commensurately or even uh, significantly at all in public health and sometimes in the education. We like to build things. We frequently do not fund the continued training and the continued education and the paying of the individuals who are supposed to be instructing. So these differential pieces. And I'm very interested in the securitization of public health um, and civil military relations. Um, so we have this global health security. If one goes over to the CDC, they are now being funded by the assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense. This one part of the CDC, the Global uh, Health Security Initiative. So you've got the DOD funding biosurveillance by the CDC. 20 years ago, public health very much had a divide with the military. And this, over the last 20 years, has been significantly eroded in a whole number of different contexts. But here is a real blatant and, and particularly striking example. Um, it should be noted that there also are aspects that have to do with personality. Tom Frieden, who's the current head of the CDC, is very close friends with Andy Weber, who's the current ASD. Um, Assistant Secretary of Defense, who's very interested in biosurveillance. Traditionally, the, the ASD is filled by an individual from the nuclear weapons laboratories who have historically treated bio as an afterstat as well as chem. So it will be interesting to see as the next ASD comes in, does this continue? And is this going to be a, a change in the direction with regard to the DOD? Which sort of uh, goes to the next piece, which I'm very interested in, which is this fundamental question of what is the military for? So among the military's core mission, something called HADER, Humanitarian Assistance Disaster Recovery, is considered to be one of their core missionaries. Now, going into the 21st century, you know, is the United States military, is that going to be its reason for being, and particularly the ground troops, the Army and the Marines, to respond either quickly in the case of the Marines or the Army in terms of having the, the capacity and the capability to be there for a significant amount of time? Is this going to evolve to be the reason, one of them, and an increasingly large reason for our military. Should be acknowledged um, and recognized that the US military is the only one who has currently within the United States the capability and the capacity to respond to this. Um, the only one who has the numbers, has the logistics, just has the pure manpower. Um, and part of this has to do with the last 30 years of budget cycles in which Funding for program execution, particularly USAID, has shifted away from government individuals, has shifted to contractors, or has been decreased significantly, whereas military budgets have increased. And this is not my observation. This was directly from Secretary of Defense Gates 
in his 2007 Landon Lecture, in which while serving as the Secretary of Defense, he advocated for increasing state, the State Department budget and USAID budget because he recognized that the military, at the time he was looking in mostly in terms of Iraq and Afghanistan, the military was doing what was seen as the military role, but in terms of counterinsurgency, there was a need for these other aspects that the United States did not have the capability and capacity to because of the decrease in the budgets to these other agencies. So the, the military is becoming the stucky. And is this going to shift the mission? Is this should, first of all, there's the sort of normative question of should this happen? Um, you know, and then this is, there's this question of is that in the best interest of the United States? Is that, the invest, is that in the best interest of what we, um, of effectiveness? So Operation Unified Assistance is the name given for the deployment of these 3,000 US troops to Liberia. Um, there are at least 175 uh, troops currently already in Monrovia. Um, and there are some interesting pieces here that I'm going to be pulling on in terms of looking at organizational interaction. Officially, USAID is in charge. The military is supporting USAID. Now, the, it's not quite clear who in the military, in the DOD, is, in, is the sort of piece in charge. On one hand, you have Andy Weber, the ASD NCB, Assistant Secretary of Defense, New Cambio, who it seems to be, have been given some policy imperator to be in charge, and unquestionably is coordinating with CDC. When I was at CDC on Wednesday, we were talking about how they were going to be responding and how you know, this policy at the, the uh, Pentagon level, these are the guys who are going to be leaving for Monrovia either within a week or less than that. So then I'm talking to guys from US Army Africa, who some, at least one of them is already on the ground in Monrovia, who are reporting up through the AFRICOM which is a combatant commander. And I found this wonderful, so here we've got Michael Lumpkin, who's the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations. So you've got Andy Weber, who's an ASD. Michael Lumpkin is also an ASD. They're at the same level. One's in acquisition technology and logistics. The other one is in policy. You know, so there's this, what's going on here in terms of who's in charge? What's the orientation? And here we've got Lumpkin. Again, he's the Assistant Secretary of Dis Defense. It's actually for uh, Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict, SOLIC. And I love this quote. Just the complexity of running um, an Ebola, Ebola treatment unit was not apparent to me until I saw it firsthand. Now, uh, as someone who spent a career focused on logistics issues, he hasn't spent a career focused on logistics issues. He's a former Navy SEAL. He retired as a captain from the Navy, as a Navy SEAL. So logistics is a really kind way of putting what he does. But he's characterizing this, is, this complexity you know, as me dealing with responding to Ebola as being more complex than many of the things that he had seen previously. As he goes on in this interview, he talks about it. It has to do with dealing with the different parts of government. Because when you go in and you do a, a counterterrorism operation, which is mostly what SEALs do, among other things, you, know, you deal mill, mill to mill. SEALs do gen, generally do not have to deal with foreign governments. They don't have to deal with USAID. They don't have to deal with foreign public health, foreign government. So it becomes the complexity here We've got multiple different organizational levels that one, in terms of looking at a case study to understand how does policy actually get implemented. And as social scientists, we love to think of new policy. At least I like to think of new policy. But this question of how do you actually implement it, I think may be the much more interesting one, understanding how that happens in these very large international structures. And with that, I will conclude, and I thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion.
bottom yeah, third. Yeah, 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 bottom. Something. Right. And actually, this morning, yeah. Emily mentioned about this that on the history that we have in US, and eleven recession and recovery here. Researchers found that. I can, yeah, just to answer a quick one. Yes, there is a lot of research on education, definitely, uh, and its impact on inequality. Specifically, it's looking into investment in human capital. So it's either education in terms of primary or secondary enrollment, but also in terms of job training, worker skills associated with the jobs and so on. And you have sort of lowering of the inequality as you move up on the investment in education and human capital. This would be Obama, mostly higher, right. Higher, higher, uh, is there enough well, with minimum wages, it it's will right. The right. With education, there is a clear cut evidence. So okay. you can go by country statistics. You can go by China. You can go by the U.S. and with the solo and the other work and so on. With uh, minimum so wages, when right. The US Will, will, yeah, right, right, right. And what you noted earlier was uh, quite true, and it has been sort of again documented the way uh, the Great Recession happened, say, 20 or 1920s, and the recession this time, because the structure of the economy has changed, especially for the U.S., talking about the U.S., and that is why it is taking so long for the impact of the recession for the lower income people, because of the type of economy we have, it's more uh, service oriented much larger than what we had in the early 1930s and 40s, which was much more manufacturing oriented, where you could see that job creation happening much faster than what is happening right now, where you are seeing more of uh, outsourcing type of in the, uh, service going on with that. Minimum wage, I'm not, yeah, I'm not okay. an expert on that, so I haven't commented yes. on yes. minimum yes. wage. <laughs> <laughs> For inequality in the U.S. I would go for taxes. Taxes? Yes, definitely. We need much more progressive taxes. And they are much more <laughs> regressive. <laughs>
let me see, finish up here then. You had to <laughs> more than, because your question was much, yeah, I did much. Uh, Migration caused by conflict is also a large flow, outflow of people happening at the same time from the same country, right? Like same ti like timing would be important, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, when, in addition, if you have like some underlying factors that uh, say government repression that drives people out. Um, about like why it is important for you to separate them. Like we usually want to see if conflict has caused people to migrate and what impact did it have. For example, there is a study on Bosnia that looks at displacement of people. And where displacement was driven by an economic factors with like, uh, Bosnians living in particular regions so before. Yeah, and huge amount of information on individuals, like in the surveys. So like, um, if you look at any of the surveys, like it's a wealth of information, it's like that. So you can uh, have a lot of observable factors on those individuals, on the regions they come from, and you can study, I mean, I can send you a paper that looks at it very much in detail, that studies, um, puts together many pieces of information and studies why people migrated from that region, right? Um, so like there is like a lot of data on individuals. Uh, Richard has a question. Thank you for the talk. I've been thinking about how to kind of put this stuff together. <laughs> and what I would love to see is actually a real tool to address the problem in my mind that the American public is kind of good fooled in a way. This doesn't want to take things. And I get it. The whole life out there truly is bad for every American person. And how can we Because I think yeah. it's a great observation. I think it would be uh, really interesting to bring them to see if we have an extensive uh, you know, experience in doing some of this visualization. It, it is incredibly powerful to be able to communicate visually, and that is the, the power and the force that one can get from using Google Earth.
significant growth. Yeah, uh, but actually that's, um, that's a thing that you find in Africa because in, um, like the gender discrimination is uh, particularly found in East Asia and South uh, Asia. Uh, in Africa, women, um, there was like historically like, uh, high mortality, any labor is important. Female labor was highly valuable in the fields as well. So they actually, in Africa, they give money for the bride. So like, let's say, if, I know, BC wants to marry someone from <laughs> there, like he has to give like a big uh, prize, like bride prize to her family, right? Uh, while in uh, South Asia, it's other way around. The girl's family has to give a dowry, and it reflects sort of like the relative, uh, I guess, abundance or like uh, use of labor. So for Africa, it's actually it has been like many, in many cases consistent across countries that women are not, when you have a shock which is sort of unexpected, somewhat, um, women are not discriminated. Mm, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Chris, coming okay. back to your uh, broader comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, hopefully you don't go back. <laughs> that's uh, the feeling depressed, right? Thank you for coming. Thank you.